Uh, yes. Um, welcome to um, this talk on Lions, Lovers and Legends, the epics of high medieval Georgia. Uh, thanks very much to Paul and Clockworks Academy for the organizational side of this. Um, and yeah, I'm, this is going to be a fairly um, kind of jumbled intro talk um, more than it is a sort of focused argument about any particular aspect. It's very much here to highlight some interesting bits of what's going on with these epics, how they fit into the world they came from. Um, and hopefully we will um, meet some interesting both real and fictional characters along the way. So um, the bit that you probably can't read at the top says Gabar Joba, Georgian for hello. Um, for those who may be generally unfamiliar with Georgia as a country, um, it sits on the east coast of the Black Sea. Um, it's sometimes described as the kind of um, a, a kind of halfway house country between Europe and Asia. Uh, it sits between Turkey, Russia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan surrounding it. It's a largely Orthodox Christian country, and that's true well back into the Middle Ages. Um, it um, Georgia largely converts to Christianity in about the, six, the sort of fifth and sixth centuries AD. Um, it's had a pretty long history of being at the edge of different empires. So going back, uh, of course, it was part of the USSR and the, before that, the Russian Empire. Um, it was a very, it was split between the um, Persian and Ottoman empires through a lot of the early modern period. Um, it was part of the Mongol Empire. Um, before that, uh, the Byzantine Empire, and so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, notable for um, its food and wine culture, which is very good. And if you haven't been to Georgia, I recommend it just for the food and wine, though there's plenty else good there. Um, choral singing culture and epic poetry, which we're going to get on to. Um, but we are specifically looking at a particular period of Georgian history. Uh, so let me take you back to the um, 11th and 12th centuries. Um, so in the 11th century, Byzantium, at the start of the 11th century, is still the major power in the Caucasus. Uh, in the later 11th century, Byzantium very much goes into retreat. Uh, you have events like the Battle of Manzikert and the kind of collapse of Byzantine power in central Anatolia. So really, it can't extend power into the Caucasus anymore. Uh, in the early 12th century, the uh, ruler David IV of Georgia, that He's more commonly known as David the Builder. Um, reconquers Tbilisi and the kind of east of the country, um, sort of essentially reunifying um, Georgia, builds various alliances and vassalships. There's sort of quite rapid, possibly overstretched almost expansion in the 1120s. And this sort of shifts Georgia's focus back eastward. So it, we're looking at a period where it's kind of moving away a bit from a very kind of Byzantinized way of looking at the world. Um, and it's becoming quite rapidly a regional power in its own right. Um, so to give you a kind of geographical idea of what we're looking at, uh, these are some of the kind of key places in the 12th century Caucasus, um, sort of uh, a bit kind of top central of the map, you can see Tbilisi, um, then as now the capital of Georgia. Uh, Giguti, uh, the sort of palace in the east, uh, is where Georgia would have been ruled from um, sorry, Giyuti in the West, I do know directions, I promise, um, is where Georgia would have been ruled from um, up until the uh, 1120s. Um, then through the middle of the century, Georgia is kind of scrapping with its neighbours over control of Kari, Ani, Devin, Ganja, these various cities that you can see kind of around the south and east of that core area. Um, so David the Fourth successes his son Demetrius uh, or Demetre, eleven twenties to the eleven fifties. Um, Demetrius's older son David then rules for about a year and dies, and is um, supplanted by the younger brother Georgi the Third. Um, and generally, in this period, that kind of core territory of Georgia is maintained albeit through various civil wars and rebellions. This is quite a kind of court-centred polity. Um, 
and very much it's not really a case of having lots of regional rebellions or anything like that it's mostly members of the family jostling for power at various points um, with certain territorial struggles around the edges um, and then finally to complete our kind of whittle stop history tour um, we get on to Tamar uh, she's Georgi III's daughter um, he the eldest of his children and uh he doesn't have a male heir uh which we will come back to in a bit uh so she's queen of georgia 1184 to roughly 1210 there's some disagreement in the historical source about when she actually died uh she is considered a saint in modern uh georgian orthodox religion uh she is georgia's first female monarch the georgian term for monarch is mipe so it's not um and that's true regardless of gender it's not a gendered word georgian is a very ungendered language although it has a lot of cultural gender features um but linguistically it's relatively low on gendering and gender terms um so tamar marries twice first to a russian prince called yuri bolyubsky um that goes badly um however bad your breakups may have been uh, until they have started two civil wars. Uh, they are probably not quite as bad as Tamar's were. Um, and then uh, she marries David Soslan, uh, an Ossetian prince raised by her aunt Rusadan, and that marriage by all accounts goes a lot better. Um, her reign is marked by, there is a certain degree, more expansionism, particularly in Armenia, uh, some of the sort of Georgian Armenian um princes the Mahagadzeli family particularly sort of expand this like sub polity into our media very effectively from the 1190s onwards Tamar intervenes in various other neighboring civil wars um and her successors are her children Georgi Lasha and then Rusadan um and things generally go worse during their reign uh because um the Mongols turn up amongst other things. Um, so that kind of brings to a close this period where Georgia is doing a lot more invading its neighbours and vice versa. Um, and because of that, invading the neighbours rather than vice versa, this period is often known as the Georgian Golden Age in uh, kind of Georgian historiography. Um, Indeed, it's sort of the title of some popular books on the period and so on. Um, and sort of some of the notable features you have during this period is a very diverse but quite centralised court. Um, so non-Georgian courtiers, I mentioned the Georgian Armenian Makhagadzeli family who have a lot of links into, um, you know, non-Orthodox Armenian Christian communities. Uh, there are Muslim vassals, um, such as the Shahs of Shivan to George's East, um, who generally seem to kind of recognize some level of Georgian supremacy. Um, there are a lot of North Caucasus, Ossetian um, and Kipchak troops who fight in the Georgian army during this period. And some Kipchaks, um, get very senior positions in the Georgian structure. So whilst this is a Georgian um, court and it's you know, primarily linguistically and culturally and so on Georgian, there is a lot of cultural diversity going on around here and therefore also religious diversity. Um, and for a lot of people in this court, they can gain power in that system via those connections they have. Um, so if you're a senior Armenian prince at the Georgian court, you could actually make use of the fact that you can build connections into Armenian communities. Um, and that's also true for women, particularly, who have often married into other places, and so they often have connectivity that their male counterparts might not. Again, we will come back to this when we get into the epic stuff in a sec. Um, there's a lot more use of Georgian titles, acknowledgement of Georgian rulers, and now we're going to actually get on to some epic poetry, which um, largely draws in this period from Persianate traditions. Um, so through the this period, there's a lot of Georgian translating of Greek and Persian texts. In the literary text, the style and influences tend to be more Persian driven. Um, you see a very similar range of countries, mythological figures and so on used as you do in some Persian texts, uh, such as the Shahnameh, uh, which is an uh, 11th century Persian um, 
enormous epic which covers you know shadow is literally the book of kings it sort of covers a huge range of mythical through to almost semi-historical by the end um characters um and the text we're about to look at uh Visramiani, which was also a persian text translated into georgian in this period so uh that brings us to the first of the texts we're looking at the Visramiani. um so this, uh, as I mentioned, it's a Persian text. It's translated through into Georgian in this period. Um, and I'm going to start by kind of giving you a bit of a synopsis um, so you can see it in relation to the other sort of Georgian written text that we're then going to move on to. So uh, Vis Ramiani is literally the story of Vis and Rami. Uh, Vis, um, she is promised uh, in marriage before she even gets born to uh, the Shah and Shah Moabad. Um, she then gets born. Her mother decides that she cannot possibly be married to anyone other than her brother because her mother thinks her brother is the only man who's suitable for her. Um, and so she gets married to her brother. Um, Moabad is not terribly happy about this and takes her away again because you know, he is the Shanja, the king of kings, uh, and can do that sort of thing. Vis does not particularly want to sleep with Moabad, so she gets a nursemaid to make a magic tal talisman, which will um, which will kind of bind Moabad. It stops him from sleeping with her in some undefined way. Um, it's 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 uh, left a little bit vague in the text what it precisely does. Um, they then essentially bury this thing in a sort of time capsule with the idea of, okay, you know, we'll leave it a few years and then when this is maybe happier with arrangements, um, we might kind of break it and sort this all out properly. Uh, then there's a flood. Uh, so this is stuck in this marriage with a shark who literally is magically prevented from sleeping with her. Um, this is then further complicated by Moabad's brother, Ramin, falling in love with this. Um, Moabad has two brothers, Ramin is the um, younger, then the middle brother is called Zad, who is particularly notable in the text for the, one of the first times he appears, uh, which where the text says something along the lines of, and a dark rider appeared on the horizon, wearing black, he came forward on a black steed, all dressed in black, and he told them that his name was Zad. This becomes a lot funnier when you realise that Zard means yellow in Persian. Um, so, uh, Vis and Ramin ultimately fall in love. Uh, most of the text is Moabad's attempts to prevent this. There are clandestine garden meetings, running away over rooftops. Vis gets taken away and locked in castles and has to be broken out of them. Ramin gets sent off to war. They spend a lot of time being... Um, I think the best modern way to put it is just very extra about everything. Uh, there is a lot of melodrama um, of the kind of, you know, cannot possibly be separated. Um, eventually, the tension of the situation causes them to quarrel. Uh, Ramin uh, marries someone else. Um, and then after a short period of time and a fairly long set, set of letters exchanged with Vis, um, decides that, no, actually, you know, this is his one true love after all, abandons his wife, finally decides that the only way they're going to stay together is that he needs to rebel against his older brother. Um, the rebellion looks like it's all going very well and then goes better than anybody expects because Moabad is unexpectedly gored by a boar and dies, uh, which means that Vis and Ramin can live eventually happily ever after. Um, I'm not sure the text actually says what happens to Ramin's first wife. Um, it's not the worst of the text we're going to see for forgetting what happens to previous marriages, but uh, we'll come on to the story of Amaran in a minute. So what we've got is this very love and romance driven story here, um, and it can be summarised quite quickly like this because so much of the text is very long discourses on the subject of love between the characters. Um, the um, So, uh, and a few kind of notes on like how it 
work as a text. It's got this very heavy use of uh, like letter sections, so epistolographic, the characters kind of writing to each other within the text. Um, and um, kind of having arguments with each other as framing for large parts of what's going on. Um, the translation, we have both copies of the Georgian and Persian versions, and the Georgian version is heavily adapted. So big, explicit kind of Islamic praise of the prophet type chunks are removed from the start and end. But interestingly, there's not much addition of explicitly Christian material to replace it. They've just kind of been stripped out to leave it as almost a more religiously neutral text in places and love is this like key causal plot driver um Ristavelli, a poet we're about to talk about a lot more uh use like references this Ramiani as a comparison point um you know uh, the sort of such and such is love for such and such was like that of this and Ramin. so there's a lot of intertextuality between these poems as well um but that brings us on to a second epic that we're going to look at, which is rather different in tone. And here we move into things that are written, um, you know, composed as far as you can tell in Georgian. Um, Amaran Darajani. Um, so of the three texts we're going to look at today, this Rabiani is the one we've kind of run through already. Um, the Night in Panther Skin, which we're going to talk about last, is that is really like the Oscar-winning film of medieval Georgian poetry. Um, it's incredibly important in Georgian culture, um, and it's a sort of great and epic story. If The Night in Panther Skin, however, is the Oscar-winning film, Amaran Darajaniani is Fast and Furious 7, and I ironically love it as a result. Um, it is very much a combat-centred epic um a lot of the text is amaran beats up everyone um amaran darajaniste is the sort of hero of the book um he is possibly linked to a folkloric character which i'm going to talk about in a minute um this is attributed to Mosa Khaneli in something written by ristavelli so we, we've kind of got again more intertextuality here um, and yes, it is a very pulpy fantasy story, as we are about to see in the synopsis. Um, so the framing of this is Absalom, the king of India, finds this mysterious building with three portraits of heroes and one of a mysterious lady. Orders his servants to find somebody who knows what's going on, what this mysterious building is. He just finds it while out hunting uh, in the wilderness. Um, and they eventually find this guy called Savar Samidze. Uh, the Z ending you're seeing here a lot means like son of in Georgia. Um, so Savar Samidze is a former companion of Amaran, the person who put this building up. Um, and the rest of the text is Savar Samidze telling these stories. They are explicitly in his voice and they are also explicitly out of order. Um, he, there is a, an exchange in the first part of the story where Savar Samidze asks Absalom, you know, what story should I tell first? And he says, uh, and the king says, you know, tell me about the building. And Savar Samidze's response is, well, you know, that's somewhere in the middle, but, you know, we, we're, okay, fine, we'll start with that. So we've got this sort of almost explicitly jumbled narrative. Um, it is also a narrative that entirely dispenses with, you know, minor trivialities like plot consistency. Amaran gets married about three times in the text um, with no, like, concept that he might have previously been married at any of these points. Um, so there's a possibly a sense that this is collating stories to an extent, but it's difficult to know. Um, so this initial cycle, which results in this building getting put up, um, involves um, a couple of other heroes, Badri Iamadizze and Nusa Nisreli, who have various adventures uh, towards winning the daughter of the King of the Seas. They fight Davies, which are a kind of general catch-all term for sort of semi-demonic beings of various sorts. There are dragons. Um, Amaran at one point breaks into a castle where the other two heroes are being held by being lifted up by a magic bird that someone told him about. There's a point where Amaran gets swallowed by a dragon. Um, and then the next paragraph starts with, 
But of course, Amaran always kept two daggers hidden in his boots um, and cut his way out of the dragon from the inside. So it's it's very much that kind of uh, adventure pulp fiction. Um, the second pair of tales are Amaran like an additional layer of frame narrative beyond that is Amram being told about the stories of this guy, Ab Abriya Rabi. Um, they are tales set in Arabia and Yemen. Um, they are actually the least fantastical pair of stories, um, and they mostly involve various wars. At the end of hearing these stories, Amram decides to go off to Yemen to find Abriya Rabi and turns up to find he's dead anyway. Uh, so that sort of closes off Amaran's part of that tale really rather abruptly as a sort of end frame point. Uh, so yeah, this kind of depth of frame is quite key to some of these stories. Uh, my two personal favourites come next. Uh, there is the story of the stars where Amaran is sent to win some princesses for the son of uh, king or rather the emir of um Baghdad, who he's serving. Uh, he goes there and finds that there are various princes from Khazaria, Yemen, China, Dayalam, which is a, a sort of southeast of the Caspian. Um, and they have a lot of duels and fight various armies and eventually win these princesses. It's very like the female characters in Amaran Darajaniani very much turn up as like the thing you win at the end of the quest line. Um, it's that level of sort of slightly old school video gamey. Um, and none of them are more video gamey than the story of the talismans where Amaran dreams of a beautiful woman, goes in quest to find her, ends up fighting metal men created by like talisman carvings. Um, he fights dragons. There's a whole section where he's on a path to the kingdom where he eventually meets this beautiful woman, where every time he wins a battle against one of the various metal men guarding it, a bunch of musicians mysteriously appear, play some music, and then disappear again, making it, as far as I'm aware, the only medieval text I've certainly come across myself to have boss fight music actually built into the medieval narrative. Um... Then the kind of later parts of the stories, there is the story of Sepadavle Darispanitse, um, who is quite interesting because he's built up as this sort of separate hero. Um, there's the various stories uh, that Amaran gets told about him in the frame narrative. Amaran then goes off to find him, unlike Ambria Rabi mentioned earlier. Uh, Darispanitse is still very much alive when Amaran arrives. Uh, they eventually do such a long duel that they've broken all their weapons on each other's shields, etc., and just sort of have a wrestling match until they get tired and eventually make friends. So there's this sort of um, hero team build up thing starting to go on here, uh, which leads on to the next story of Mizichabuki, yet another of a hero that Amaran is getting told about. Um, there is an amazing set of bizarre high fantasy scenes in this where Mzee Chabuki goes to the lands of the sorcerers. Um, there's a point at which, due to making a mistake when they um, get offered some food and decide to let somebody else eat it, which is wrong for some reason that is not entirely clear, um, in various stories, you might expect this to be that they get cursed or that they fall asleep or something like that. No, in this, what happens is they suddenly find that they are back at the beginning, at the entrance of the land of the sorcerers. Um, so again, this sort of teleport back to the start of the level and have to do it again um, bit comes into play. Um, Ultimately, however, Mzee Chabuki leads, gets to a bad end because uh, despite all the heroic things he does and um, winning the daughter of the, I think, King of the Khazars from the... Um, from the dragons and the land of the sorcerers, uh, he then gets murdered. Uh, and this is why Amaran is ultimately found, and Amaran and Daris Panidze from the previous story then gang together and go off and avenge his murder. Um, so there's there's this sense or there's this sort of prowess thing building up where because Mzee Chabuki has such you know, renown, it's then important for the other heroes to ensure that he is properly avenged, despite the fact they don't know him. Uh, he, they, you know, they just get told about him and that brings on the kind of end quest to that plot arc. 
the final set of stories, uh, Amaran goes to a land called Balch and uh, fights uh, Balcham Hamidze here, and also I think ends up fighting various local demons by the end of it. Um, he gets married yet again and becomes ruler of that land, and that's the end of his sequence of stories. So the interesting thing with Amaran is he appears very prominently in Georgian folklore, or rather a character called Amaran does, but he's really quite different. The folkloric Amaran is often the child of a human and some kind of nymph or spirit. Um, he is, it's, he, it's part of a set of like Prometheus-like legends you get across the Caucasus. Um, so other characters, Pachamat, Nasran, and other Caucasus cultures um, have similar aspects. Uh, there is usually some aspect, I mean, Amaran doesn't usually steal fire from the gods, but various of these other characters do. Uh, Amaran very commonly in his stories ends up in some way challenging deities. So particularly there's stories where he wrestles Christ and is chained under a mountain uh, for you know, daring to do so. Um, Amaran also has a dog called Kersha in the folklore, uh, who I feel is important to mention here because he is one of the goodest boys in mythology. Uh, when Amaran is chained under a mountain, uh, Kersha is there with him. Kersha spends his whole time trying to lick through Amaran's chains because Kersha is a magic flying dog. Kersha will only take one year to do this. And this is why there was a tradition in Georgia that on every Monday Thursday, all the blacksmiths were supposed to strike their anvils at noon, which kind of ceremonially reforges Amaran's chains and unfortunately undoes all of Kersha's hard work, which is a pity for the good boy, but uh, probably a good thing for humanity because um, Amaran usually ends up wrestling Christ after he has effectively beaten up everything else in creation. Um, the beating up everything in creation is the main thing he shares with the um, epic version. So there is this very strong prowess culture. Contests are important. Even when Amaran is making friends with somebody, he's probably trying to wrestle them. Um, and this is interesting when we compare it to our historical chronicles for this period, which emphasize personal presence in battle for the kind of male figures. And even for Tamar, who can't be personally present in battle, there's this very strong sense of displaying what she's doing while battles are happening in the chronicles, particularly praying. So again, Tamar gets this like personal attribution of success in battle by the fact that she sort of essentially wins it by praying better than her opponents. Um, there's this very heavy use of secondary storytelling framing um, throughout it. Uh, the women characters, unfortunately, are largely secondary and presented objectives and plot hooks in this text. Um, there's also this very heavy use of fantastical locations, much more so than in the Shadame of Isramiani. This is a very fantasy heavy and fantasy location heavy story. You've got the Kingdom of the Stars, the Kingdom of the Seas, various other places like that. And also fantastical persons. So, for example, when Amaran is working out how to get to the Kingdom of the Stars, he meets this guy called Abu Talib the Wanderer, who just turns up randomly on a white elephant um, and you know, says that he's travelled all the world and he can tell Amaran how to get there. Uh, there is a wide array of creatures throughout it, unicorns, dragons, davies, metal men, sorceresses, shapeshifters. You could write a pretty solid Dungeons and Dragons bestiary out of this thing. Um, so it's the most fantastical of the stories we're looking at. Um, and more fantastical, though, um, it is more fantastical than The Night in Panther Skin, though The Night in Panther Skin is sort of almost a halfway house, um, as we're about to see. Uh, Ristavelli, the author of that, uses fantastical place and characters, but in a slightly more nuanced and less beaty up -y sort of way. Um, so let's uh, finally move on to the Knight in Panther Skin. Uh, Vepkisa Kansani um, is the sort of proper name for it. Uh, it is, was written by Shota Ristavelli. We know this because he tells us this in the poem itself. It was written for David Soslan, or rather it was commissioned by David Soslan and written for Tamar. So this is very explicitly 1190s to 1200s. Uh, you can probably yeah, really date this to within a 20-year time span. We also know it was dated after the other texts we've looked at because Ristavelli refers to them. Um, 
the Knight in Bandersgate has a massive impact on Georgian culture compared to these other texts. Um, I mean, Amaran Darajani is Darajaniani is perfectly well known, but like the Knight in Panther skin in the 18th century was a key part of a Georgian dowry. You know, you, you gave away your daughter with a copy of the book. That was a core thing that you did as a sort of upper class Georgian in that period. And Ruth de Verley gets so ingrained in Georgian culture himself that he gets to appear in folk tales as a character as well in later centuries. Um, so uh, to run through the synopsis of a fairly large text quickly, um, I have retold this story quite recently in full, which takes about 80 minutes, which we don't have, but I will try to run you through it in a sensible speed. Rostovan of Arabia. Uh, he makes his daughter Tinati in the air because he has not had a male child. If that sounds familiar to you, you're correct. Uh, we will get onto that in a moment. Um, he and his general Abtandiel then go hunting and see this a weeping knight wearing a panther skin. Uh, title character Avtandil being essentially the main hero, but not the titular character of the piece. Avtandil goes in a quest to find this knight, um, sort of put, spurred on by Tinatin, who he is fairly um, in love with. Um, and he runs around for three years, uh, by which time everybody is probably nearly about to think that he's dead. But he eventually, sort of almost just in time, finds this maid, Asmat, uh, who is living in a cave, and she can introduce him to the knight in panther skin. Uh, he is Tariel, a prince of India. Tariel's father was king of one seventh of India. Um, then Again, we're seeing another framing narrative system dropping in here uh, as Tariel tells his story. Uh, the rule of the rest of India, Farsadan, um, Tariel's father, um, Saradan, becomes Farsadan's like main general uh, as, as an effort to kind of unify India. Um, Tariel then falls in love with Farsadan's daughter, Nestan, um, and after various adventures and wars he fights on Farsadan's behalf, Farsadan decides to uh, marry Nestan off to a Khorezmian suitor. The Khorezmians are an actual country in this period um, in sort of Central um, Asia. Um, and but when this Chrysamian suitor turns up, um, somewhat at Nestan's um, imposition, Tariel murders the guy uh, and then goes to Farsadan and says, well, you know, uh, I am rightfully the Prince of India as the only male heir to either of the people who are rulers, who are kings of India. Um, Farsadan, amongst other things, ends up in this sort of standoff with Tariel, but also blames uh, a part Kanji witch he's related to, who he had entrusted with the suitor's safety. Um, she is not very happy with the fact that Farsadan is about to execute her, so she then kind of magics Nestan away. Um, and Tariel goes off in search for her and fails to find her for some years afterwards, uh, which is ultimately where... Uh, Avtandil comes into the story. Um, hang on, is this? Uh, yeah, right. Uh, so Avtandil, having heard this, returns to Arabia. Rostovan does not want him to go away again. Avtandil does so anyway. Uh, there is a story that involves Rostovan throwing a lot of chairs at walls when he hears about this, but Avtandil runs away regardless because, you know, the, the drive to help Tariel, who is sort of Sort of sworn a certain amount of brotherhood to is too great. Uh, Avtandil arrives, Tariel has effectively nearly died of depression in the meantime. Um, Avtandil has to spend some time encouraging Tariel to you know, uh, not be such a drama queen and accept that there is still hope in the world. Um, Avtandil then goes off to see Freydon, a friendly ruler who gave Tariel his um, horse. Uh, Freydon then points Avtandil onwards to a city called Gulansharo, the city of flowers. Uh, so Avtandil goes across the sea, and here we, he kind of moves out of this like Arabia, India, like vaguely real world locations to Gulansharo, which doesn't exist. Um, but Avtandil uh, assists in Gulansharo, and in possibly one of my favorite characters in the text, Fatma, the wife of Gulansharin merchant. Um, Fatma, uh, both flirts with Avtandil um, and then ultimately ends up getting Avtandil's assistance to kill a like jealous blackmailing lover. 
Um, once she has been helped out in this way, she get she manages to give Aftandil information about where Nestan is, and also through the fact that Fat Man has various servants who can do magic. Um, indeed, they are slaves who can do magic, and the magic includes walking through walls. So how they remain her slaves is not entirely clear. But um, she um, manages using these servants and slaves she's got to get a letter to Nestan in the castle of the Kajis, these sort of sorcerer wizard um, people who have stolen Nestan away. Uh, Tandil returns to Tariel, they get together with Freydon again, attack the Kaji fortress, free Nestan, and ultimately live happily ever after. So, um, compared to the other tech we've seen, these are very human and complex characters. And this is partly why the Night in Panther Skin has such a high reputation as a text, and why I very much recommend reading it. Uh, you know, Rostivan is a sort of aging king who has serious anger management problems. Tariel is, you know, ultimately the core character that the story is built around. And he is, you know, acknowledged by everyone by the end of the text as the greatest of the kings. You know, Rostivan, when they all go back to Arabia, acknowledges Tariel as his superior. But Tariel is also an enormous drama queen um, and, you know, is like struggling with his own despair throughout the text. Um, Nestan is the most beautiful woman in the world, but also causes a lot of Tariel's problems by poking him into murdering people, amongst other things. Um, Avtandil has problems throughout the text himself, particularly in his relationship with Rostovan, where he is both trying to do the things he needs to do to, you know, be an ideal knight and help his friends, but also not wanting or ending up kind of undermining his leash by um, defying him in various ways to do so. Romance is also central to the text, and not just as a plot hook, but also because it's the way that a lot of these characters end up kind of building empathy with each other. Like ultimately Avtandil and Tariel end up helping each other out because they share that sort of woman I can't entirely be with right now problem. Um, and so this sort of empathetic element of romance is very key to um, Mr. Valley's work. You still get this important of prowess, hunting, personal combat, etc. is very important in building these relationships, but also recognition of authority uh, provides plot points and markers in the text. So close to the end of the text, um, um, before they go and conquer the Kaji's fortress, they go into the cave that Tariel's been staying in and find a, you know, cache of magical weaponry and so on, which is very helpful to them. But interestingly, at that point, Rustavelli stops referring to Tariel as a knight and starts referring to him as a king. And sort of Avtandil at that point is explicitly recognizing him as king. And that's an important moment, a kind of switch in the position that Tariel has vis-a-vis -vis Avtandil. And so the recognition that Avtandil provides Tariel also always provides Tariel with a certain amount of his power. Um, faith is very interesting and complex in the text. Uh, like we saw with Visramiani, it's not a very heavily Christian text, despite the Orthodox majority Georgian audience. Avtandil does pray to God, but he also calls on the seven stars, that's the sort of five planet sun and the moon, to aid him. At one point, uh, there is one group of merchants who turn up who are explicitly Muslim, but most of the other characters are not identified as such. But most of them are from places expected to be non-Christian. And maybe this is part of how Rustavelli is able to play with some of these concepts, is the sort of, well, they're Arabian, so we can't expect them to be Christian in the first place. So it's OK that I'm building this sort of very um, lit this very not faith driven setup for the story. Um, identity. Despite, you know, Tariel's Indian, Avtandil's Arabian, Freydon is possibly a Turk, uh, but the but their appeals to each other are true across the character identities. The identities may be used to analogize states of mind. So there is a theory that the Indian characters are the kind of like dramatic, uh, like pursuing their passions types, whereas the Arabian characters seem to be a bit more rational. 
but by the end of the text, Tariel is acting more rationally like Avtandiel does. So there's not a kind of fixed identity um, thing there. Connection is hugely important in the Night in Panther skin. You know, Asmat connecting Tariel to Avtandiel is a key point in the text. Fatman providing that connection between um, Avtandiel and Nestan is also key to the plot being moved forwards. So this idea of women being in a position to provide connectivity that the men cannot provide each other is a really important part of women having an agency in this text that isn't true in the stories of Amaran. Like Fatman, despite the fact that she is cheating on her husband multiple times during this text, is plot central and ultimately rewarded for her actions as well. So there's a sort of um, sense in which because you know she is contributing to that kind of wider story, um, she is very much still seen as a good character, um, despite you know breaking what might be some of the sexual mores of the time. Um, as you may have noticed, Tinatin's story, the you know, heir of a male heir lacking ruler, very closely mirrors that of Tamar's. A famous quote from early in the text says, a lion's cubs a lion's all. You can't help but read that and feel that there's probably a bit of a like, again for the people at the back in the Georgian audience going on. It's possible, therefore, that Rostovan is modelled on Georgi III. There's some hints in some of the contemporary texts that Georgi III might have had a temper problem himself. Um, there's the Horesmian issue. You know, Tamar um, like Nestad is rescued from a bad marriage to a certain extent. Interestingly, there's also this complex web of recognition. Like in Georgia at the time, you have the Shirvan Shah. You also have the Georgian monarch who is nominally their liege, but still recognizes that the Shirvan Shah is a monarch in their own right. So this kind of complex chain web of recognition among rulers is mirrored in this text. Um, also, interestingly, the Charesmians being kind of secondary villains in this, um, what Rostovelli couldn't have known when he was writing it is that they were actually going to invade in the 1220s, uh, which ultimately was one of the things that really messed up the reign of Tamar's daughter, Rusadan. Um, so Tariel, like the Georgian rulers, is becomes a king of kings by the end of the text. Women have quite defined roles. You, know, you don't get warrior women in this text, but they are plot driving. They're using connections to build that power. Much like Tamar is presented as in the Chronicle sources, she, her power is presented by the appointments she makes, her lineage, her use of prayer, um, and other women get power in this period by negotiating. Tamar's aunt Rusadan is a diplomat. Uh, there's a coup early in Tamar's reign attempt, which Tamar faces down by using women as her negotiators. Um, and this sense of acknowledgement. A strong ruler is one acknowledged by the strong. You get strength by connecting people together in this culture. Um, and this cultural recognition is emphasized over a sort of identitarian idea. Um, and so I think that brings us on to my kind of final slide, which is a couple of reflections on what epics mean for me as a historian. So these epics clearly aren't reality. They're not accurately mirroring Caucasus society in this period, but they do give some ideas of some of the soci some societal values, this kind of prowess culture. What does a good hero look like, a good ruler? What does a good man look like or a good woman? How can those people use power and what are the right ways to hold and use it? And what are the sorts of challenges that heroes can and should overcome? And they show us some very interesting things, I think, about how people conceptualize relationships and connections, which for Rostovelli, and indeed, I think, for the people of the court that he was telling this story to in the 1190s or perhaps 1200s, were a very core part of how power and the good life were conceived and how they saw the world. Thank you for listening to this little stop tour.